What up, peoples? <laughs> Misfit internet peoples. Um, anyway, man, we've been off for a while. We've had a bunch of crazy stuff going on, but we're okay. Uh, we're back again here today, and uh, we're going over Romans chapter 12, which I'm super pumped about. But um, before we do, we're going to kind of preface it with, we're going to kind of break down and, and give a, you know, a summary of everything that we've gone through, because there's just so much to unpack in the book of Romans. I mean, there's, there's the Romans road, and then there's uh, the, the, the plan for salvation, and God's plan for Israel, and there's just so much that's in the, the first you know, 11 chapters of the book of Romans. So we're just going to kind of overview all that, and I feel like that's necessary and important in order to fully understand chapter 12. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. But other than that, um, we're doing pretty good. I'm looking forward to jumping into it. So I'm going to pray. My wife's going to read. And we're going to get after it, man. So, uh, yeah, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this day and this opportunity to come together, God. And I just thank you, Father, for friendships and relationships that we have with you, God, and, and that your spirit dwells in this place, Lord. And I just thank you, Father, for your word. Father, if I had to be led by my, my heart and my mind, I would just be tossed about to and fro, man, like a, like a ship in the ocean in the middle of a storm. But Father, I have your word, and your word keeps me steady, and it keeps me calm in the midst of this crazy thing called life. And so I just pray, Lord Jesus, that as we read your word, I ask Holy Spirit that you would wash us all clean. Each and every person that's hearing this right now has fallen short of your glory. So I just pray, Jesus, that you would wash us clean by your blood, and that we would have ears to hear, Lord, and eyes to see what it is that the Spirit would have to say to us. Guide us in your love and kindness, Lord. Thank you for the joy that I have in my heart to be known as your son, a prince in your kingdom. Thank you, my king. We love you and we praise you in the best way we know how. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 All right, man. So, yeah, we're going to get into it. I'm going to have Amy read and then we're going to break it down. <laughs> All right. Romans chapter 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly, as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Mm. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If prophecy, use it according to the proportion of one's faith. If service, use it in service. If teaching, in teaching. If exhorting, in exhortation. Giving, with generosity. Leading, with diligence. Showing mercy, with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Mm. Detest evil, cling to what is good. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lack diligence in zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs. Pursue hospitality. Mm. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Mm. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. Mm. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath, because it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. But 
If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I love this. I love Romans chapter 12. All right, so we're going to get into it. Romans chapter 12 is where we first start getting into um, any kind of specificity or detail into spiritual gifts. Raise your hand if you've heard of spiritual gifts. Okay. A lot of... A lot of people have heard of it before. Cool, man. So Romans chapter 12 is not meant to be a full breakdown of what the spiritual gifts are that people as believers in Christ possess. It's not what it's meant to be. It's All Paul's trying to do is simply make a point. And that's really all Paul's been trying to do the entire book of Romans. He's trying to get a point across. He starts off with 1 through 3, Romans 1 through 3, where he's really breaking down the, the weight and the gravity and the depravity of mankind. And he's showing us just how stinky and nasty and horrible we can be as human, be as human beings. And then he starts to talk about Abraham. And he, tar- he starts to talk about the Abrahamic covet- covenant. And then he talks about how God's not done with Israel. That in spite of Israel rejecting the Messiah, God's still not done with Israel because even in the rejection of the Messiah, God made promises to the nation of Israel that he would fulfill. The church did not take Israel's place. I repeat, the church did not take Israel's place. Israel is still God's chosen people, and God still made a promise to Abraham that he will fulfill. This is why it's grace. This is why it's amazing. If you guys look back, Moses in Deuteronomy um, chapter 9, verses 4 through 5, God's going through and he's speaking to Moses, and he's explaining to him, or God's speaking to Moses, and he's explaining to him why God is going to take care of the nation of Israel and deliver them into the promised land. And he makes it explicitly clear in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 9, verses 4. He says, it's not because of your righteousness. I'm not eradicating these people because you're such a good person. I'm not giving you this holy promised land, Rayleigh, because you're such a great person. I'm giving it to you because I told you I would. I'm giving it to you for my namesake. See, Moses presented an argument. God was frustrated with the nation of Israel, frustrated to death. And he says, you know what? I'm sick of all of you. You know what I could do? I could wipe all of you out like this, and I could pick a new chosen person tomorrow. I could reestablish the new nation tomorrow. And Moses says, yes, Lord, you could. You're big enough. You're powerful enough. You absolutely could. But what's that going to say about you? Because the whole world has been told that we are your people and we are your nation, and then you're telling me you're going to deliver us into the promised land and then allow us to become eradicated due to our sin? That would make make you go back on your word. How would your name get out to the nations? How would your name get out to the people? Wouldn't it be better to go ahead and establish the, the nation of Israel to show your mercy and to show your love? And of course, God's like, well, yeah, all right, fine. It's not that he persuaded God. It's not that he persuaded God. He didn't change God's mind, right, which obviously was his goal. But God wanted Moses to plea on behalf of his people. See, God's only looking for one. My point is, when God made a covenant with Abraham to establish him as a nation, do you guys remember what happened when we went through Genesis? He put Abraham in a deep sleep, and he took several different animals, and he cut them in half. And what they would do to make a deal back then or a contract is they would take several different sacrifices, they would cut them in half, and then they would hold each other by the thigh, and they would walk through the cut animals. And as they would walk through, they would repeat. They would look each other in the eyes, and they would repeat the terms of the contract. This is our contract. You said you were going to deliver me five bulls on this day for X amount of lambs. And when they got to the other side, they would grab each other, round and round, do si Grab each other again, walk through, and repeat it again. They would do this three times. So God tells Abraham, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get the animals together for, this is where we get the term cutting a deal. You guys ever heard that? That's where it comes from. That's where it comes from. You cut a deal. So you cut the animals in half and you walk through. Anyway, so God says, Abraham, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get all these animals together, these sacrificial animals, and and I want you to cut them in half. And me and you are going to make a contract. Abraham says, okay, but after Abraham cuts all of them in half, what happens? Abraham gets knocked out. The Lord goes, 
Go to sleep. And while he's asleep, he sees in his mind, in his vision, he sees this lamp move through the cut pieces. And basically what God was saying is, I'm going to make a contract with you. And the contract is that I will establish you as my people. And you will be as multiple, your, your descendants will be like the stars. Here's the catch. It doesn't matter what you do. Regardless of what you do, I'm going to be faithful with my covenant. That's grace. That's a gift undeserved. This happened in the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament, right? And then here comes Jesus. And he is God, and he's going to pay. He is the greatest gift and the ultimate sacrifice for the, for the souls of humanity. And he tells us, hey, I'm going to make a contract with you. I'll die. I'll suffer. I'll pay the price that you deserve to pay. I'll pay it. And it doesn't matter what you do. I'll pay it. That's grace, and that's why it's amazing, and it's beautiful. Ergo, we are transformed into Israel. Yes, we are adopted Israel. Does anybody know what the word Israel means? What's that? Close, close. It's princes of God. Princes of God. Israel means princes of God. Princes of God. Why princes? Because God's the king, right? And masculine, a lot of people get hung up on the masculine term because it's like, well, I'm a lady. Yes, but what it is is it's the definition of a title. Mm -hmm. It's a title. And that title has to carry weight. And, in, in, and when you're looking at a, you know, a, a monarch establishment, right, a monarchy, well, who's the highest? The king. Who's the second highest? The queen. The, the queen. And then who's the third highest? The prince. The prince. And beneath the prince are there all the princesses, right? Princesses usually get married off. So the title that you're getting is the title of prince, which means you're heir to the throne. You're literally an inheritance. You will inherit the kingdom of God because you're a prince, a prince of God. And that's a beautiful thing. But So because you're a prince of God, because you receive grace, and because God loves giving, he doesn't stop there. That's not all. There's more. But wait, there's more. And a lot of people get, this, uh, get these next few verses conflated. So I'm going to go through them. Conflicted, conflated. Are you going to tell me, is conflated not a word? Is that what you're telling me? So. <laughs> Time out. I want a Google search right now. <laughs> conflated is a word. Okay. That's, that's what I'm saying. Conflated is a word. I, I'm so, I apologize if you're watching this online. We have to pause. I need an actual definition. What? Combine two or more ideas into one. Conflated. Boom! Ooh! It's a word? It is a word. Yes, ma'am. It is a word. Thank you, big brain. You're welcome. You got that Jimmy Buffon. That's the second time this has happened this but week. It says combine two or more ideas into one. Right. But they don't. But that it's a word. But, but it's a word. It is absolutely a word. You just used it wrong. Word. But the two ideas, here's the thing. The two ideas, when you combine them into one, they, 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 they cancel each other out. Oh. It's like oil and water. So you divide one by one. That's what Romans chapter 12, verse 1 is all about. So let's get into it. Therefore, time out. Therefore, brothers and sisters... In view of God's mercy, that's important, I urge you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Kirk, you just told us two seconds ago that Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. But now you're saying I'm supposed to sacrifice the rest of my life? Okay. That's what he's saying. Yeah. That is what I'm saying. Why? Why? Verse 2. Do not be conformed to this age or this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and the perfect will of God. I call it cleaning your mirror. Wipe me down. You have to clean your mirror. Listen. The moment that you decide that you're going to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you, you acknowledge him. You acknowledge your sin, and you acknowledge that you're in need of a Savior, and you accept Jesus as your Savior. You become a mirror. 
And as you grow in your relationship with God, you can never be snatched away from him. You're his mirror till the day you're in glory. Once you're saved, you're sealed, baby. That's it. You know why? God doesn't go back on his word. If God makes a promise, he keeps it. For his own namesake, he keeps it. It's not contingent on you. If you receive the Lord Jesus, God will seal you until the day you go home. But you're a mirror. And what you do have a free will choice in is whether or not you clean your mirror. Now, if you want to let your toothpaste muck up on it and your boogers and your steam from washing your hands and soap particles and poo particles and everything else that gets on bathroom mirrors, if you just want to let it get all nasty and dirty, if you want to let it get nasty and dirty to the point to where you can't even see anything out of it, that is up to you. But frankly, that's a terrible way to live your life. The best thing to do would be to take some Windex or some Kroger brand spray, something with ammonia in it, and spray the glass and clean it. Why? Then you can see yourself better. Maybe you don't want to see yourself. That's fine. You can see others with it. Our whole goal as believers in Jesus Christ is to reflect the image of Jesus. And if you let your mirror get filthy, you can't reflect his image. You see what I'm saying? If you got a dirty old mirror, I could shine lights at it all day, but that don't mean it's going to be bouncing off till you wash that nasty thing. You know what I'm saying? You got to wash it. And so we have to allow ourselves to be washed in the water of the word. We have to allow ourselves to have our minds renewed. And this is a big one, guys. Whatever, man. You, gotta, you, got, you have to allow yourself to have your mind renewed because your mind, when you first come to Jesus, is, is a, a riddled, flesh, self-serving ball. And all it's designed to do is lead you to your death. Our brains are literally consumed with nothing more than our own satisfaction. And if there's one thing I've learned in my 34 years of life, Pursuing my own flesh sure leaves you feeling real empty, man. Real empty. It feels good in the moment. Absolutely. It feels really great. Laughter. That's why Jesus, he would walk through the town. And as he would walk through town, he would hear large groups of people who had no thought of God and didn't pursue God at all. And he would hear them laughing and Jesus would start crying. He would cry because Jesus understood that those who weep, their, their, their sadness will be turned to laughter. And those who laugh now and live a life pursuit in the pursuit of flesh, they will cry. They're going to mourn one day because they're not spiritually minded. And that's why I get, that's, I get so afraid for, for the youth and, because that, it seems like entertainment and, and checking out of life circumstances seems to be the primary directive for y'all's generation. Rather than facing difficult things, confronting difficult issues, and hitting them head on, doing your research, studying, what is your opinion on this, that, or the other? It's easier to just watch some TikTok flick or scroll through something or just completely become apathetic to it entirely and not engage with the world around you. And that's sad. That's really, really sad. I hope if I don't do anything else in my time here on earth, I hope to at least inspire people to be curious, to pursue. If you have a doubt, pursue it. Research it. Don't rest on your laurels and don't trust a thing I say. Yeah, you heard me. Don't trust a thing I say. If I say it, I want you to go research it. I want you to decide if you agree with that. Develop your own minds as an individual. And live your life sacrificially. Because I'll tell you what, man, living a sacrificial life is, is beneficial for multiple reasons. But one of the primary ways it's benefited our life is because of time that we committed to sacrifice for other people when we needed it, guess what happened? People were there for us. They came to our rescue like no other. Whether it was a financial need, whether it was an emotional need, a physical need, whatever it was, people came to our side and they helped us out in dark times in our lives because of their relationship with the Lord Jesus and because we poured and sacrificed our time into them. Living a selfish life literally will leave you miserable and alone and you'll feel empty. That's why Solomon would say it's better to be at a funeral than at a party because at least at a funeral you understand the dynamics of life. And the fact that it does come to an end. 
It's, I'm not telling you to be miserable all the time, but I am telling you to understand that the only way to actually have true joy is to live a life of sacrifice. That's why I have it tattooed across my chest. To live a life of sacrifice, regardless of what that means. Yeah, I was asleep when you guys came in today. I'm exhausted. Live a life of sacrifice, because it's the only way to live a life with true fulfillment. Serve others. Do not be conformed to this age, Misfit Gang. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. If you are not challenging, challenging yourself or allowing yourself to be challenged in the Word and in life, you are going to become an unteachable, lazy slob and worthless and devoid of purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Literally, you need to allow yourself to be open to what it is that God wants to do in your life and what he's trying to speak to you. If not, listen, dude, I, I like a good anime just like anybody else. But if your life has consisted of binge-watching anime, your life is pointless. Your life serves no purpose. Listen, it's one thing to be a consumer and it's another thing to be an asset, Okay. To be a consumer and to be an asset. I'm trying to encourage misfits to be assets. Be assets. Be intellectual warriors in your atmosphere. In the, and spiritual warriors in your atmosphere. In the way that you pursue God and you pursue truth. Don't pursue it. And that's why I always get so frustrated with people that they, they spend 27 years pursuing their flesh. 27 years pursuing their own free will. And then... They want to come to me and ask why they're absolutely miserable every single day. Because listen, all you're doing is pouring into a God-sized hole. And guess what? We're not big enough to be God. So if you spend the re your entire life just pouring into these vain projects, yeah, your career will give you purpose for a short season. Whatever it is that you're involved in will give you purpose for a short The video game, guys, when you're playing a video game and you're going through the story of a video game, it feels like there's purpose in that. You're getting to know this character. You're watching this character develop. You're controlling this character's actions. Then you get to the end. You're like, man, that was a lot of fun. You know what? Let's play. I did it. And then eventually you get burned out, and you end up doing like my brother's doing, selling all of his video games in a yard sale. Things in this life can, can provide false hope. Or, or false purpose. There's only one thing in this life that can give you consistent purpose that consistently satisfies, I promise you. And it's a pursuit of the knowledge and relationship of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is 66 books and it's unending. It's unending. I cannot tell you how many times I've read the Bible. It's a lot. And guess what? I don't know everything in it. Not even close. I learn stuff every single day. I listened to a four-hour sermon today, and this dude was literally making my brain blow up. And it's a four-hour sermon on a passage I've read 790 times. Dude, I must have read Romans 12 800 times. And I'm sitting here listening to this. Uh, he's, a, he's a pastor, but he's also a physician. Uh, he's also he has his um, doctorate in physics and all this stuff. And he's like, like teaching me all these things. And I'm like, Pfft. my brain's blowing up, man. I was like, dude, this guy's wicked smart. Always, never, be, never be content on where you're at in your relationship with the Lord or your relationships with others. Or your relationship with others. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to get to do life with you guys. It's a privilege to get to know about the things that interest you. It's a privilege to get my butt kicked in chess by Isaac. It's a privilege. I enjoy it. Because that means that that's a part of his life that I've now, I've gotten the liberty to share in. It's a beautiful thing. So allow God's perfect will to manifest in your life through being open to correction and cleaning your nasty mirror. If you know that there are things in your life that do not honor God and that you're drawing you away from him, break out the Windex, homie. You know what I'm saying? Remove that nastiness from your life so that you can better reflect the image of God and so that you can draw on a deeper understanding and a deeper relationship with him. That's right. Wax on, wax off, Daniel's son. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly <laughs> as God has distributed a measure of faith 
to each one. What does it mean to view oneself sober-minded? The essence of having a sober mind is recognizing that you are royalty in the eyes of God, but that you are adopted royalty, and it is our job as royalty to serve others. That's the identity of having a sober mind. It doesn't mean you walk around all the time like, Oh, is me. I don't have a tail. I'm pretty much just a big old bag of horribleness. That's not humility. And anybody who tells you that's humility, they're dumb. That's not biblical humility. That's not biblical humility. They're, they're sorely mistaken or they're ignorant. And ignorant is not a dirty term. It just means you don't know. They're either mistaken or they're ignorant or they're dumb. The point is... Humility is not walking around whipping yourselves with change. Humility is understanding where you stand in the kingdom of God and understanding what your role is here on earth. Yes, I walk around and I strut when I walk. Why? Because I understand that God saw fit to redeem my soul from the pits of hell and give me everlasting life. It gives me a little bit of a strut when I walk. But I also understand at the very same time that my purpose on, in this life and in this world is to serve others. It's not to lord my lordship over them. It's to serve others, to show people. Jesus Christ, guys, Jesus Christ, the King of kings, Lord of lords. He wasn't even a prince. He's king. And what did he do? He washed feet. He healed the blind. He helped people prepare for their wedding. He served. He served. Till the day he died and rose again, he served. And he's serving us now. He serves us now through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, through comforting us, through preparing our places where we'll dwell in heaven. He's nonstop working and serving. And this guy is the Lord of the universe. So little bitty old me who's not that awesome, I can serve too. I can serve too. Well, thank you, sweetie. I think I'm better than my Matthew McConaughey. It's inside joke. Um, anyway, the point is we can serve. Yes, you are. Yes, you are sons and daughters of God. That's true. But you can also serve. And you'll find that the only way to develop true purpose is to use the gifts that God's given you to serve. And guess what, guys? That doesn't look the same. The way that you serve is not going to be the way that you serve. And the way that you serve is not going to be the way that you serve. You guys are going to serve the Lord differently. Why? Because we're all a bunch of weirdos. God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Let's say you have the gift of teaching and you have the gift of teaching. Both of you have been given a different measure of faith. You might drop everything. You might drop your college career. You might drop everything that you have to counsel and disciple young women and to teach. And that might be your calling because that's the measure of faith that God has given you. You might have the gift of teaching, and you decide that you want to continue to finish your college education and your art degree, and that you want to teach, but you want to teach people about the Lord through teaching them to see God through art. Now, that's a measure of faith. Does, are you wrong? No, you're not. You wouldn't be wrong. That's your measure of faith, and that would be your measure of faith. You see what I'm saying? Not one, one is not higher than the other. Matter of fact, both are extremely necessary. Both are extremely necessary. And it says, Now, as we are many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many, who are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, according to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If, prophe if prophecy... Um, use according to the proportion of one's faith. And prophecy is simply speaking forth the truth of the word of God, okay? This doesn't mean you're some voodoo healer who can see 20 years into the future or some wild mess like that, okay? You're not, you're not poking dolls with needles or whatever. This just simply means that you can, you can speak forth the truth of the word of God to somebody in their life. And may, maybe you have a hard time memorizing scripture. Maybe that's not your gift, right? Maybe scripture doesn't stick with you like that. That's not, that's not the gift that the Holy Spirit gave to you. You can't just spout off a verse that speaks into somebody's life. But maybe you can. And if you can, do so in accordance to the measure of faith that has been given to you. Okay? And then he goes on and he says, 
Um, if service, this is really complex, guys, super weird. But if your gift is service, like serving people, you should serve people. I know it's weird. Okay. Super heavy. If teaching, you should you should teach. You should probably teach. That's probably a good idea, right? I mean, if that's your gift, you should do it, right? <laughs> and then uh, if exhortation, which um, exhortation is, or if exhorting in exhortation, exhorting is one of these really funny words that can kind of go both ways. There's two ways you can exhort somebody. And exhort simply, to exhort somebody simply means to, 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 to guide them in a positive direction, basically. And you can do that through words, you can do that through actions, you know, through gift giving. There's a lot of different ways that you can exhort somebody. Sometimes you exhort somebody by saying, hey man, you're being a freaking jerk. Okay? What you're doing right now is not cool. And obviously you don't do that until you pulled the plank out of your own eye like Jesus taught us, right? First, we got to pull the plank out of our own eye to see the speck in our brothers clearly. But after you've done that, if the Holy Spirit leads you to, you know, call your homie out, sometimes you got to call your homie out. I personally have this gift. I do not have a problem calling you on your stuff. doesn't bother me at all whatsoever. I'll tell you straight up how, what it is. You know what I'm saying? You, it, it, I keep it 100s. You know what I'm saying? And, and I have brothers and sisters in Christ that keep it 100s with me. And so I really appreciate that very much. It's very uh, exhorting. Um, if gener uh, if giving, then generosity, guys. If you're gonna, if you're, it, some people's spiritual gift is giving. I totally relate to this. Some people's spiritual gift is giving, and they can have two dollars in their pocket, and you want a two dollar honey bun, and they have no more money, and they just pull two dollars out and give it to you. They don't even think about it. They're like, oh, God will take care of me. Here you go. Then it's not even a thought. Where other was, bro, this is my last dollar, bro. I don't know where I'm gonna eat next week. You know what I'm saying? Like, I need this. Right. Well, it's not even so much stingy. I just honestly believe once you're in Christ, like certain people have the spiritual gift of giving. I had a buddy, Johnny, used to be the same way, man. This dude would just give the shirt off his back and wouldn't even think twice about it. I mean, he would just give his stuff away all the time. Like, Bro, you got to stop that. You ain't never going to have nothing for you and your family if you just keep giving stuff away. And he was like, Lord will take care of me. The Lord will take care of me. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, he'll take care of you, but, you know, let's not get crazy. But who am I to judge? You know, I mean, that's, that's his gift and his relationship with the Lord. We all have different operations. Um, if leading with diligence, I love that. Whether you know it or not, some of you are called to be leaders. That means you are given a spiritual gift of, of, of leadership. This isn't something that you get. All these gifts that we're talking about now, uh, prophecy, teaching, service, exhortation, general, uh, giving, leading, um, these aren't things that you develop. This isn't, these aren't things that you practice. These are things that once you become saved, once you give your life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit via Jesus gives you a gift. Not only does he give you salvation and eternal life, but he also gives you a special gift. And it's a gift that he wants you to use in order to function inside this crazy thing that he calls the body. And sometimes... He gives you the gift of being a toe. And sometimes he gives you the gift of being an ear. And sometimes a mouth, and sometimes a nose, and sometimes eyes. Whatever your function may be, but he gives you a gift. And sometimes you'll be a foot, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit will come over you and he'll turn you into an eyeball. <laughs> Whatever he decides to do. Sometimes your spiritual gift is maybe service. But then all of a sudden you run into somebody in a gas station who's broken hearted and the Holy Spirit comes over you and just all of a sudden you just start remembering scripture and you remember like you just have the perfect words to say to console this person and to exhort them. But also use prophecy to, prophecy to speak truth into their life. And that wasn't of you. You know it wasn't of you. You're like, bro, I ain't even read my Bible all week. I don't even know where that came from, man. I'm just quoting Colossians like I know it. And that's a gift. That's a gift from Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit. I personally love those moments because A, I'm a knucklehead, and B, I love it when God does things that there's absolutely no way I can take credit for. I love that. I love that because that means that I got to be present while Leonardo da Vinci was painting the Mona Lisa. I got to be there and watch it happen because that's what it's like for me when I see God move. When I see God move, I feel like I'm just... I'm just watching a masterpiece come together, and I don't have anything to do with it. Even though I get to be there sometimes, I'm just like, cool. 
Right. He put the puzzle together and I just get to watch it happen. It's beautiful. So anyway, regardless of what your gift is, and this maybe this is something we'll do once we get into um, Corinthians, because I think that's probably where we're going to go next, First, First Corinthians. And once we get into um, uh, First Corinthians uh, chapter 12, 13, and 14, we'll probably do a little spiritual gift lesson and kind of go through the Bible. But I don't feel like that's the point Paul's trying to make here. I think the point that Paul's trying to make here is that um, because we're the adopted Israel, because we're the we're the adopted church, we're the adopted chosen ones, right? That we're meant to work in unison. Whether we're working with Jewish believers or whether we're just working with other other Gentile believers, we're regardless of what your gifts are, we're meant to work together. And that's why I'm so grateful. Like, look, dude, I might not agree doctrinally with everything that the Pentecostal church does, but dude, I love those people. They are awesome. If you've ever gone to a Pentecostal church worship service, that is my place, dude. That is where I live. I turn up. Those people worship like I worship. I love it. We're clap. Dude, literally, you will go to a Pentecostal church service. You will clap so hard you can't feel your hands when you walk out that place. They will just be beat red, just blood all in your hands. You've been doing this for a solid hour and a half. <laughs> Woo! Sometimes three or four hours. I love it. Absolutely love it. Churches, they only sing hymns. There, you can worship however you want. You can right. raise your hands, and nobody people, will look at you twice. Jumping, hooping, hollering, screaming. I, I, I personally love it, but for other people, that's extremely unsettling. That that bothers them. I mean, you guys know how we get down here at Calvary. Like, it's getting super spicy if there's a sway that starts to happen. It's like, whoa, calm down now. Y'all getting crazy up in here. If there's a little sway that starts, or if somebody goes... A little clap starts to break out. We're like, whoa, getting wild at Calvary Chapel today. <laughs> getting crazy. <laughs> it's, wick, it's wicked true. It's like, oh, there's somebody started a close sla- uh, slow clap. It's getting crazy. But that's just, how, that's just how our church is. They just don't get super crunk when it comes time to worship, and that's fine. But there's a lot of elderly people. There's a lot of elderly people. It's a generational thing, but that's super fine. There's not a problem with that at all. We are supposed to worship in unity. So if you are the type of person that wants to get crunk and go crazy, do it at the back of the church so you're not causing other people to stumble. But my point is that even though we're all a bunch of weirdos, this thing we call the human race, we're all a bunch of weirdos, man. But in Christ, there's a unity there. When uh, I got to serve, when um, there was a series of tornadoes that came down through Alabama, this probably like eight years ago, eight or nine years ago. And as the tornadoes came through, it was really terrible. A lot of people's homes were destroyed. And uh, a lot of people were homeless. There's, a lot of people were homeless. So I went there with my sister and her friends, and we got to serve out there. And I'm telling you guys, first of all, it was all Christians out there. It was all Christians out there. But Catholic, Pentecostal, Baptist, Calvary Chapel, we were all out there serving together. Serving together. I didn't care what denomination you came from. It was time to serve the Lord and to serve people. And that's what we did. We passed out water. Well, I had a super amazing conversation with this super sweet. She was like 90 years old Catholic lady, and she's out there just divvying out water to all these like poor people. And like, you know, she's got to ration them out and hand them out to, you know, individuals that, you know, are without fresh water because they lost their homes, you know. And she's 90 years old, out there serving the Lord, loving Jesus, and, and, and helping these people out in her free time, not for praise. Her name's not going to get put in a newspaper. She, she receives no accolades for this. She's doing this because she believes this is her spiritual act of worship. Tell me that woman doesn't know Jesus. Tell me that woman doesn't have a relationship with the true and living God. You're a liar. She does. She's from a different denomination. And that woman loves Jesus. And the body is a weird, complex organ, just like the bride of Christ. We are a weird, complex organ now, I, you know, obviously we, we go to Calvary Chapel because I believe that the Bible should be taught chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and, and, and with expository teaching and taught in context and all that kind of stuff. But that's what ministers to me. That's what ministers to me and my family. I'm a pastor, so I enjoy when, when um, Pastor Steve and Pastor Aaron and Pastor Jerry, I love when they teach that way. It really speaks to my heart. So that's why we're, we go to Calvary Chapel. We agree with them doctrinally, but at the same time, I still love my brothers and sisters in Christ no matter what denomination they're in, all right? Let love be without 
Hypocrisy. Now, what Rayleigh doesn't know and Clotine doesn't know and Eliana doesn't know is that they actually are the biggest hypocrites in the room. <laughs> because you're all in one act. You're actors. Bro, that's the reason why we're hypocrites. That's why you're hypocrites. The word, uh, I forget how to say it, hypocritos, I think, in the original language, it, that's what it meant. It meant to pretend to be something that you're not, which is literally what an actor is. Oh. That's what an actor is known as. Yeah. I totally forgot about me. Oh, I apologize. I totally did. I, I just thought of them because she's going to one act all the time. And Anyway, yeah, yeah. Well, she's, you're actually the biggest hypocrite in the whole room because you've been doing it <laughs> the longest. So you're a huge hypocrite. But no. Yeah, it, it's basically the equivalent of when you break the word down, it's the equivalent of somebody who wears a mask and pretends to be somebody they're not. Absolutely, absolutely. That's um, that's where that's where this word comes from. But it says, "Let love be without hypocrisy. Detest evil, cling to what is good." When I read this verse, I think of my wife. Every time I read this verse, I think of my wife because my wife has this God-given. I know she has the she has what um, uh, her spirit. One of her spiritual gifts is mercy. She loves to show mercy. She has a pile of mercy. And when negative or traumatic things happen to her in her life, her natural reaction is to cling to the positive aspects of it. She doesn't like to rest in the negativity. This is a godly thing. We should do this. We gravitate towards negativity because pain feels real. And hope feels like an idea of a possibility, but it's not a tangible because oftentimes hope involves you not being able to see success. If you're going to hope for something, that means you're hoping for something that's not yet here. But we gravitate towards pain because that's real. I felt that. It's here. It's now. So what do we do? We gravitate towards negativity. It's the same reason why the news cycles constant negativity. Constant negativity. Because people relate with it and they resonate with it more. People gravitate towards negative emotions. Paul is warning us, let it not be so. When you love somebody, really love them. How do you do that, Miss Fit Gang? How do you really love somebody that you don't really love? The only way to do that is to allow yourself to be filled up with something other than yourself. Because let's face it, we're all selfish monsters. If we had it our way, we'd eat cakes and candies and we'd do whatever we wanted to all day. We absolutely would. Whatever our hearts desired, that's what we do. Instead of actively going out and serving people on a regular basis. I mean, if we really slow down to think about it, we're pretty horrendously selfish individuals. If you really just slow down for five minutes and think about it. I mean, how many of you have cell phones? Raise your hands if you have a cell phone. How many times those Amber Alerts go off? How many times do you read intimately the details on the Amber Alert and then try to actively pursue what it is that... Right? What do you do 90% of the time? X. Oh, this is so annoying. Hit the X. Right. Because one time it actually happened during class when everyone's Amber Alert went off. We're horrendously selfish people. We are selfish people. Do you guys know what an Amber Alert is? Yes. That means a child has been kidnapped. Or a car. All right. No. It's usually a car. No. No. No, the, the car is the description of the vehicle in which the child is placed in. It's a kidnapping alert. It's a kidnapping alert. Yeah. I mean, somebody's been snatched up. And what do we do? Hold on. What do we do? What do we do? We don't care. We hit the X button. Why? We're in the middle of playing a video game. We're in the middle of doing whatever it is that we want to do. And our first reaction is X out of it. That's insane. That's insane. Do you realize how insane that is? Imagine if you were kidnapped today and I got a notification on my phone and I was like, <laughs> I'm playing Dragon Ball Z, I bro. Okay. Yep. Dang, that sucks, bro. Playing Dragon Ball Z, though. Can't talk. Dude, that's horrible. She was like, Am I the only one that reads these? I read them too. I read them too. But I'm just saying, I'm saying how many times do we X those things off and we don't memorize the license plate number and actively look for it when we're going around, if we're honest. And this isn't, this isn't a mark against you. I'm just trying to simply get you to see it's extremely obvious how selfish we are. It's extremely obvious. We are some selfish individuals. 
Human beings are horrendously selfish. The only way that we could love without hypocrisy is to receive love from something that's pure. And the only thing that's pure in this universe is the love of God. That's it. So if you want to love people with purity, the only way to love people with purity is to receive the purest love. It's, uh, it's um, when, you're, when you're doing like biblical counseling, they call it, um, uh, th- there's, there's three different types of ministry. There's, there's personal ministry, there's public ministry, and then there's like uh, podium ministry. Which public ministry just means that you're ministering to groups of people individually, but publicly. And then, you know, podium ministry is where you're ministering to a mass group of people. But personal ministry is the most important ministry. And that's the ministry of you taking quiet time to receive and understand God and grow in a deeper relationship with Him and understand that you're loved by Him. Because if you think about it, man, every ounce of love that you give out that doesn't come from God is counterfeit. It's counterfeit. It's all counterfeit. You need to allow God to fill your heart up with love so that you may pour it out onto others. And that's how we love without. So detest evil. Cling to what is good. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. And this reminds me of me and my wife. Outdo one another in showing honor. Don't do be doing that a lot. You're like, let me wash the dishes. No, I'll wash the dishes. No, I will wash the dishes. Yep. You go sit down and relax. <laughs> Out, dude, That's try. Do. Your goal is to try to outserve one another. You want to outserve one another. You want to see what you can do. And what you guys don't, maybe don't realize, maybe you do, is that man, the blessings that come with it. If you will get up off of your selfish keister and start serving people on a regular basis, man, you feel better. Mm-hmm. It's so, it's crazy. It's like you do the opposite of what you think you want to do, which is like be a lazy couch potato and play video games. If you actually get up and start serving people, man, it's wild what God will do in your life, man. It's radical. Some of the, like, the, the, the most powerful healing moments I've received in my life as far as my relationship with the Lord and my scars from my past and stuff like that are in the middle of me serving people. Because mm-hmm. every time I look at y'all's faces, I see aspects of my personality and things that, things that I used to be when I was your age or ways that my mind used to work when I was your age. And I see all the, just the mass myriad of potential that's in each and every one of you. And so all I want to do is pour the rest of my life out into you because I know what you're capable of. I can tell when I look into your eyes the people that you are today and what God could do with you in the future. And I get pumped about it. Mm -hmm. And it makes me want to serve you more. And as I serve you more, I just get blessed in the process. It's really sweet, man. Mm -hmm. It's a really good deal. Um, Do not lack diligence in zeal. Be fervent. In the spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Jesus would say, be a nagging widow. Literally. Literally. So he's telling a parable about this widow who is seeking justice from a judge. And and the judge was not a good judge. He was an unrighteous judge. He would take backdoor deals and did a bunch of really, you know, slimy, scammy things, you know. But this widow wanted justice. And every single day she would nag this judge and nag this judge and nag this judge, asking for justice, asking for justice. And he got so sick and tired of hearing her voice. He was like, fine, here. And Jesus said, if a nagging widow could wear down an unrighteous, ungodly judge, how much more will the Father in heaven answer your prayers when you ask? A good and holy Father. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. I try to tell you guys, man, about daily moral inventory. I try to tell you about the benefits of committing time to prayer. I'm telling you guys, the things that you battle with at your age, the the emotional warfare, the, the 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 pressures to be in a relationship, the seeking seeking acceptance from your peers, trying to figure out where you fit in this crazy thing called life, all the different wars that you guys go through mentally and emotionally, all that stuff gets laid to rest, man, when you pray to a true and living God. 
It's a peace that surpasses all understanding. If you will commit time to do it, he'll do amazing things. I promise. And I'm not lying. I tell the truth. This is an amazing thing. I take time to do it every single day. I go outside and I walk around. The other day, I was so 38 hot, I was ready to knock holes in walls. I looked at my daughter. I was supposed to help her study for a test. I just looked at her and said, baby, daddy's got to go on a prayer walk. I got to go. I'm about to choke somebody. I'm going to cut somebody. I got to go. I was better. I was ready. I just need to go. I need to go spend some time with my dad, man. My dad makes me feel better. He comforts me. He is the comforter. He comforts me. And it helps you write it down sometimes. Yeah. Writing it down helps because it helps solidify the response. So sometimes I'll write down what I'm upset about or what my prayer is. I'll write it down. And then as I feel the Lord speaking to me in his heart, whether it's through scripture or whether it's just through me hearing him speak to my heart, I'll write down his answer. And Amy does this too. Amy will pray. And when she prays for something, she'll write down what she prayed for. And then in the future, when God answers that, she'll make a note of it so that she can remember all the times that God was faithful. This is important, man. This is really important because it reminds you that God's not some big old dude chilling up in the clouds. Like God is a true and living person that's around each and every one of us on a, on a daily basis. He cares about what you have going on. And he cares. He absolutely cares. Yes, he even cares about one act. Yes, he even cares about football. Yes, he even cares about your desire to have a relationship with another person. Yes, he cares. He really does. And if you, if you lay your desires at his feet, man, he'll bring peace and comfort to your heart. I'm not saying he's always going to give you the answer you want, but what I am saying is he will provide you with a peace that surpasses all understanding. I love this, man. Bless those who persecute you. Let me jump back. Uh, share with the saints that are uh, in their needs. Pursue hospitality. Obviously, we want to be hospitable people. I mean, clearly, you don't have your own home yet, right? But we want to be hospitable to everybody that we come across in as much as it is within our power to do so. We want to try to be good hosts. Because literally, guys, we're representing Jesus. And that's all Paul's saying. He says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. That one sucks. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Sorry, I relate a lot to that. It does, man. It does. One of, the, one of the saddest things that the Lord ever told me was vengeance is mine. I'm like, dang it. Dang it. Really? You got to take that one? You got to take that one from me? I really, really want this. I really, really want that one. But he says, no, sorry, it's mine. And you know what? He does a better job at it. Mm -hmm. True. Makes it look cool. He's a way better judge. He's a way better judge of character and a judge of someone's heart than I am. Because all I'm doing is I'm judging this per the entirety of this person's life and the entirety of their value as a human based off one interaction that I had with them that miffed me. You understand what I'm saying? These people ticked me off one time, and I'm like, you suck. That doesn't... That doesn't entail that person and the entirety of their being. Maybe our personalities just clashed. Maybe I was a jerk. They were having a bad day. They were having a bad day. I was having a bad day. Just because you have a bad interaction with someone doesn't mean that that person is a horrible piece of trash who deserves to burn in Hades for the rest of their days. Although, if we're honest, sometimes that's how we feel. Yep. We're just like, dude, you suck, bro. Put these hands on you, man. But God says vengeance is mine. God says vengeance is mine. And we should show grace. There was... um. One of the coolest things that uh, one of my mentors told me one time is that uh, he said, the person that gets under your skin the worst, if you will commit to pray for that person and love that person and serve that person, even though they're bugging the teetotal fool out of you, you'll actually find out that that person probably becomes your best friend in the world. And that's happened to me on two separate occasions. Two different individuals whose names I will not mention because there's a possibility that they will watch this. When I first met them, I wanted to choke slam them. I couldn't stand them. Everything about their personality just got under my skin. It just bothered me. I felt like they're dorky and they were rude and just like just just drove me nuts. But over, but I decided I was like, you know what? I'm being judgmental. I don't know this person. I don't know their life story. I'm gonna commit to love this person and be their friend. I'm gonna make myself go have lunch with them. Make myself go play whatever weird game they wanted to play on whatever game console it was. I was like, I'm gonna make myself do this. Because God told me to bless 
bless those who persecute me, and bless those who are my enemies. And so I was like, I can't stand this dude, so I'm going to go hang out with him. And yeah, we ended up being best friends. Like, I still love this dude and talk to him on a regular basis till this day. We're super tight. I gave him a chance. I laid down my own judgments, my own self-righteous predisposition about who this individual was. I laid all that down, and I let Jesus minister to my heart about who he was as a person. And then I found out he's actually a great guy. I was just misjudging him because I'm not God. And neither are you. So maybe the next person that drives you absolutely crazy and you want to punch him in the face, maybe you should, I don't know, pray for him? Do something nice for him? I know it sounds crazy, but it works. It really does. Then he says, I love this, live in harmony with everyone. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Misfit gang, I don't care how humble you try to be. If you live and you hang around a bunch of jerks, Guess what you're going to turn into? A jerk. A jerk. A jerk. Don't we know it? Who you, asos- who you associate with develops who you are. That's why Paul is trying to tell us, listen, you want to live humble? You want to be teachable? You want to be a, a, a sweet aroma to God? You want to reflect the image of Jesus? Kick it with humble people. Don't kick it with proud people. Don't hang out with boastful people and arrogant people. Kick it with humble people. And I, I already explained to you guys what humility is. Humility is not walking around like Eeyore. Woe is me. I don't know to tell. I'm probably wrong anyway. No, that's self-pity. That's self-pity. And that's actually self-righteousness, believe it or not. You're depressed because nobody thinks that you're as awesome as you think you are. That's what self-pity is. It's pride. Mm-hmm. It's literally pride on the opposite end of the spectrum. Well, nobody wants to do what I want to do, so that just must mean I'm horrible. The reason you're sad is because you're mad that nobody likes you as much as you do. Okay. True humility is understanding that you were saved by grace and that you are absolutely royalty. And as royalty, it's your duty to serve others and to love others. That's humility. Not the Eeyore mentality. She's got a phone call. Um, and then I love this. Associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. You ever heard that one, Raybug? If you think you know everything, you know absolutely nothing. nothing. I'll show you. If you show me somebody who knows everything, I'll show you an idiot. (laughs) Real talk. My mentor used to tell me when I was in the drug rehab program, my mentor used to tell me all the time, he was like, if you're, he was a little harsh. I probably wouldn't have worded it this way, but the dude loved the Lord. The way he worded it was, if you're not teachable, you should be dead. Uh, Jesus. (laughs) That's what he said. He said, if you're not teachable, you might as well be dead. He said, because you've lost all, you're void of all purpose in life. Think about it, though. If you're not teachable, what does that mean? That means you're not willing to grow into the image of Christ. That means you're not willing to grow as an individual and as a person. That means you're just willing to be stuck in limbo. And at y'all's age, very... Very few of you have ever held down a consistent job or brought any sort of income or goods or services to the community. Ergo, if you start being unteachable now, if you guys start becoming little know-it-alls now, guess what? You're going to be real worthless when you're about 30. That's just a fact. We're talking practicality here. I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm being practical. If you are unable to learn and to receive from others, you will cease to have purpose. That's why Paul prefaces this earlier in the chapter. You guys remember, he says, listen, do not be transformed to this world. Do not conform to this world. Why? So that you can be open to the perfect will of God. So that you can be open to the things that are good. You have to be open to learn the things that are good. Why? Because your flesh and your heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. And if you follow your heart, it will take you down a wrong path. Now, as a youth pastor, I have repeated that statement humpteen billion times. And I have seen humpteen billion youth refuse that statement. I've seen so many young men men and women sit in this very room and make the decision to pursue their flesh rather than pursue a relationship with Christ. And it's heartbreaking. You know why? Because it always ends badly. Every single time. There's a young man that I loved with every piece of my heart. I still love him with every piece of my heart, man. I love this kid. 
absolutely loved this kid. It was, it was, he was in my very first youth group. We had a very close, intimate relationship. And I could not talk this guy out of pursuing his flesh. He had it set on his mind that he was going to pursue his flesh. And he did, buddy. He pursued it all the way. And in the process, he broke relationships with his parents. He broke relationships with his siblings. He broke relationships with his church and the people that knew him and loved him around him and isolated himself into basically a sea of sadness. It's horrible. And I saw the whole thing coming when he was just a 14-year-old kid. I saw it coming. I saw it coming down the road and I could do nothing to stop it because at the end of the day, your faith and your life is in your hands, not mine. I can preach to you with every fervent passion, an ounce of you know, blood and passion in my body, but I cannot make you choose what's right. That's part of why it's love and that's part of why it's beautiful. You have the choice. You have a choice. Choose life and life everlasting. So he goes on and he says, don't be stupid. Listen to others. If you consider yourself wise, you're a dummy. It's in the Bible, all throughout the Proverbs. It's all throughout the Old Testament. It's all throughout the New Testament. If you think you're wise, you're dumb. In the martial arts, they call it maintaining the white belt mentality. It doesn't matter if you're a four-degree black belt. You always treat yourself as if you're a white belt, which means you're always open to learn. True people. Boom. Boom. Always. And be willing to learn. Learn from your losses. Learn from your victories. Always be open to learn. Your teacher has to show you the mindset you need to learn. Absolutely. And the number, the greatest teacher of all is trying to teach you every moment of every day. If you would slow down to listen, you could, you could, if you guys, I don't know if you know this, but in the Old Testament, when Elisha, um, when he was establishing, not Elijah, but Elisha, when he was establishing a school for prophets. I got you. Air five. He was establishing a school for prophets. When he was established, one of the things that the prophets would have to do is they would have to go out to a, a field, and they would have to sit in that field, and they would stare across the field, and they would listen for the voice of God to speak to their heart. And that was part of their training, to become a prophet of God. They would go in a field, and they would shut up for hours. They wouldn't say a thing. They would just leave their ears their spiritual ears and their hearts open to whatever it is that God is trying to say to them. Guys, if you are not taking time to allow the Lord to speak to you, you are doing yourself a huge disservice, a huge disservice. Imagine if me and you had a relationship and all it was was you talking at me the whole time and I never responded. Now, some of y'all might be okay with that, but a true relationship is reciprocal. I put in information, you put in information. We receive information from one another. If we enjoy it or it causes joy or laughter to come, we might talk again, right? And this is how real relationships work, right? Have a real relationship with a real, true, and living God. Act as if God exists. He does exist, so treat him like he does. You see what I'm saying? Have a conversation with him. Talk to him. I've been trying to teach my daughter this since I was, she was a little bitty baby. She would pray, and she would always pray the same prayer, Every single night, which I understand when you're a little kid, you know, that's what you do. You know, they teach you, you know, God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. You know, she would do this thing or she would always, dear Lord, I just want to thank, like she's writing a letter, like he's way off in the clouds and she was writing a letter to him. And I was like, guys, babe, why are you talking to God like that? You don't talk to me like that. I'm, he's more real than I am. I would just like to point out where I don't pray like that anymore. No, she doesn't. But I'm just saying the point is God is more real than I am. So if you're, if you're going to talk to me, if you can talk to me eye to eye and have a full-blown conversation like a normal human, you hear some of these people pray, you're like, bro, what book are they reading out of? <laughs> Lord Jesus in heaven almighty, thou is to be the greatest of all us in the thouest of thou lands. <laughs> like, bro, you don't talk to me like that. <laughs> huh? They feel like God will hear their prayer better if they speak in King James. You know what I'm saying? James? They, keep, they speak in old King James, and all of a sudden it's more spiritual now. God hears them better. Bro, you tripping, man. You don't talk to me that way. Why are you talking to God that way? It's like you sh in school you struggle with having friends. Yeah. But if you struggle with having friends, that's okay. Want to know why? Because the real friend can talk to you every day. Yeah, you can talk to God every day, and he'll always be there for you. He's, he's, got, real. he's, got a, he's really great at listening. He loves to listen. Um, he's a great listener. 
Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's sight. If possible, as far as it depends on you, misfit, live at peace with everyone. That's a really big clause that I'm really glad Paul put in there. Because sometimes, guys, you're going to run into people in your life there's even people there's even people that I've had relationships with in this church that our personalities just clash. It doesn't mean that they're a bad person. It doesn't mean that I'm a bad person. Just for some reason when our personalities get together, they just don't mesh. And that's okay. It's not a big deal. It's not a problem. That means that God has um, saw fit for me to influence a different group of people in my life than them. And they're meant to influence a different group of people in their life than me. You know what I'm saying? That is not a bad thing. Sometimes you're going to meet people and y'all just ain't going to jive. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You could still, you still are called to live peaceably with anybody in as much as it is up to you. You serve people. You, you serve your enemies. You feed your enemies when they're hungry. You allow vengeance to be the Lord's. You live a peace-filled life. Let God fight your battles and you'll always win. But the point is, sometimes, yeah, God, I love that the Holy Spirit encouraged Paul to put this little clause in here because, look, man, some people, some people are just jerks, and they're going to hate you just because they don't like your face. I literally, I've literally been punched in the face because a guy told me he didn't like my face. That's fine. That's totally fine. That's totally cool. I get it. Some, some people just don't like your face, and that's fine. You don't have to jive with those people, but you can maintain peace in as much as it's possible for you. So in that way, you represent Christ and you, you, you clean off your mirror. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath. Because it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you will be heaping coals, fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Now, the way that we conquer evil is with good. Now, this is a really controversial topic in today because we have social issues that we're battling with. Very serious social issues, social injustice. There are people being gunned down in the street for the color of their skin, and this has been going on since the inception of America, okay? There's issues in the police force. Now, I'm not going to pick apart every single issue, which ones are right, which ones are wrong. I'm not to judge that. That's only for God. But all I can say is there's clearly a problem. <laughs> can we at least agree on that? Yes. Yes. When, when people are breaking and looting and rioting and smashing stuff, it's like that'd be like if I came home and all of a sudden my, my wife was wicked mad. Well, it's not my fault. Well, she didn't just get mad out of nowhere. She didn't just wake up and just get ticked. It's not like she just woke up and she's like, you know what? I'm just going to smash everything in the house. That's not how people work, okay? There's, there's, a, there's a law in science. It's called everything has an equal and opposite reaction, okay? That means that if somebody is mad and they're mad at you, guess what, guys? They probably have a reason. They probably have a reason. You probably did something. I bet you money you probably did something. People don't just get mad for no reason. Matter of fact, most people enjoy happiness. They like to laugh. They actually try to medicate their lives and situate their lives in such a way that they only feel happiness. So if somebody's angry with you, it's because you messed up, probably. It's a, it's a very fair assessment to make. If my wife is angry with me, I probably screwed up. Now more than ever, now more than ever, as representatives for Jesus Christ, Listen, I don't have all the answers for what's wrong in the world. I don't. But one thing I do know is the answer to what is wrong with the world is us reflecting the image of Jesus and encouraging people to have a relationship with the true and living God who changes his lives. That I do know. Why? Because I've seen it work in my life. I've seen it work in all my friends and family. People who pursue an intimate relationship with God it makes everything else seem like a hill of beans. Tragedy can strike 
And you're able to continue looking forward with hope for what the future holds because you understand that this tragedy isn't the end and that if God allows a fiery trial to enter your world, it's because he wants to draw something out of you and he, he's doing it for your betterment, even though it feels terrible in the moment. He's doing it for your good, always, because he loves you. So sometimes, guys, you're going to run into fiery trials, but the best, the thing that this world needs right now more than ever is they need misfits. They need a pack of weirdos who love Jesus and who ain't stupid. That's what the world needs right now, and that's each and every one of you guys. I don't think you hear misfits. There is a song for that. Is there? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Which one? Uh, but this world, we, well, but this world needs by... Um, Nice, yes. That is a good song. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. But that is exactly what the world needs, man. They need all you weirdos out there, all you crazy freaks and geeks. They need all you guys to show, I am, to show the love of Jesus. They need the weebs out there. Yeah, they need the weebs out there. They need, they need, no, you're definitely not stupid. You need, they need you guys to, to seriously consider the issues of the world. I'm talking to you to seriously consider the issues of the world, and to enlighten people in grace and truth and love. They need us now more than ever. They need Jesus more than ever. And they need us to reflect the image of Jesus. So yes, live your life as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, as is your spiritual act of worship. The best way you can worship God is by reflecting his image. And how do you reflect his image? Recognize that you are royalty and it is your duty to the people to serve and to love. No matter what. Make sense? Romans chapter 12? Yes. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. All right, all right. Well, for you watching online, love, peace, and chicken grease.